Gotta go. Yeah, I'll call you back. I'm with that real Kelly. Hi, I'm Michelle with Google, and I am the host of The Realtor Lady Podcast. And this podcast is an exploration of the real estate industry with the people who actually work in it. I talk with real estate agents from all across the U.S. We go over the similarities and the differences in our markets, all with the idea to better inform and give people a better idea of what's going on in the real estate market as it's changing. I also talk to vendors, lenders, and people who have other roles in the real estate community, all to better give you an idea of what's going on. Think of it as kind of like real estate commentary instead of sports commentary. And if that's something that interests you and you like to follow the real estate market, tell your friends you can't talk right now because you are with the Realtor Lady. Hey there, it's Michelle, the Realtor Lady, and today's episode is with Dean Davis. He is located in Jacksonville, Florida, but he's moving to Miami. So if you're looking for a great agent in that area, he can help you. He also um, has experience helping people um, buy and sell when they're in the military, which I haven't had anybody on yet who um, has that experience. So that was nice. But we also uh, talk about about when we throw out some acronyms, it's National Association of Realtors and it's DOJ or Department of Justice who are talking about actually having the buyer go find their own agent and pay them and the seller just pays the listing agent. It's an idea that's being floated around and we really think it's going to happen in the next probably 10 years, not anytime soon. But Dean has a little bit of experience with it working in Germany. So enjoy the show and comment, like, share, and subscribe. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Hey there, it's Michelle Riplogel, and you are with The Realtor Lady. And today I have Dean Davis. He is located in Jacksonville, Florida. He works with EXP Realty. And we have a few subjects we're going to go over today. I was talking with him, actually, initially I interviewed him to to talk about how HGTV is changing the way buyers buy. And uh, I will be touching on that in the next coming episodes. But Dean let it slip that he worked in Germany as a real estate agent. And I just really wanted to hear about that because it was different. But there's also some things that uh, how they do real estate there may actually come here to the States. So uh Dean, uh, take it away. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, talk about your journey in real estate and your stop in Germany, as it were. Yeah. All right. Uh, So my wife works for the military and uh, so I'm a veteran. Um, I had lived in Germany previously. My wife uh, got stationed there and then I went as the spouse and I was looking for a job and I was trying to learn the language. I didn't want to just do like the standard work on base, like pretty much everybody else does. And uh, as I was learning this language at the, at the local school, I got introduced to a, a guy that asked me to help him write some ads to advertise an apartment building. So uh, it turned out that he was a, a Remax broker uh, in Germany, and he, he was asking me to maybe help write advertisements, correct some of the English, make it, you know, be able to connect a little bit better. So one thing led to another and I started meeting, uh, you know, people in his office. And then I started spending more and more time there. And then, well, Hey, you know, if, if you had a license, you know, you could do more. Uh, so by then I had a pretty good grasp of the language and, you know, went on to get my German real estate license and started working with them. And uh, kind of a funny story from that uh, while we were there, one of the people that I, I worked with mostly had immigrated to Germany from Turkey. So um, he his only languages were his his primary language was Turkish and you know German was his second language. Well, he's the guy that I spent almost every day with for the first you know couple of months while I was so learning wait, Turkish and then German. So right English is a distance distant third. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even wasn't he could say thank you uh, <laughs> and that was a, about it. So so we I had to only communicate with him uh, through my newly learned German language. And uh, after, after a couple months of that, I, I started noticing people would laugh at me when I you know, would, would speak in German. And, and uh, I, so I asked our broker, um, Gerhard, 
and 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 he was laughing too and he said you know now that you mention it, it uh, this this is true i had developed a turkish accent so here i am <laughs> this you know native english speaker uh you know new to the business new to the the country and you know the person that i talked to the most so here i am you know trying to trying to do my best to to speak in the local language and and i've got this turkish accent that i had no idea so kind of crazy <laughs> So, so what is the process? You're at the Remax office, and somebody calls in. What what does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, that's uh, that is what it, what it looks like. There's a lot of maybe door to door canvassing neighborhoods, looking for places uh, available because um, I, there's probably been some changes since I left in early 2014. Um, but at the time, there were no there's no MLS, so the listing agent held everything. And, you know, people would come to, to different brokerages and say, what do you have? And then, okay, what do you have over here? Wow. Um, so you'd see these, yeah, you'd see these buildings with literally just, you know, papers in the, in the front windows as you'd walk through the town. And, and that's, that's what was available through that brokerage. So to, to work as a buyer agent, we would have to, um, they, you know, they would actually have to hire you, you know, no different than you would, you know, you'd hire someone else to represent you, like you're an attorney or an accountant or, or anything else you'd have to say, hey, I want you to help me find a place. And then there, there was no um, no clear cut co-broke. So no guarantee that, you know, if they didn't like a house that you had, there's no guarantee you could help them. So you really had to negotiate um, every step of the way. So then they would say, okay, I do want to hire you. And then you would do the kind of the investigation. You would go look for another property at another brokerage to possibly sell them. Yeah, it, it could go that way. Um, of course, by the time you, you added the fees, and, and I, I really can't quite, the, the fees were a bit lower than here, but obviously you weren't paying uh, both sides, but um, but it was still very expensive. So then, you know, the, the thing to do in that case was would be to, hey, I want to live in that apartment building. Okay, so now we would have to go to that apartment building and actually find a listing um, or an upcoming listing, and then we'd get a you know, the coming soon would be, okay, this family just isn't ready to move until the end of the summer. So, all right, let's, let's get you there. But for the most part, the, the vast majority of it was listings is, is finding who was ready to sell their home and helping them market it to, you know, people think of, you know, Germany being, or anywhere in Europe, if, if you haven't traveled around there, the, the countries are pretty small. Right. Um, you know, we lived in uh, Southwest Germany in a town called Kaiserslautern, and you, we could drive to, we could be in Paris within five hours, and five hours the other direction, we could be in Switzerland. Um, so, you know, you, you didn't have a huge area to kind of canvas, um, but but people generally would be looking regionally, so we'd, we'd look hard to to get those listings and keep that. So how'd you do? I did all right. I mean, I was only there, you know, it takes a while to spin up in any real estate field, and we were only there two years. So I, you know, it's been, a, it took me about 10 to 11 months to, to get my license and have a reasonable grasp of the language. And then I spent another year actually working. So, and I think I sold, you know, four or five homes, actually I, I sold you know, four homes and did one pretty good size lease. So um, kind of the average agent here in the U S does that in a year. So um, I don't like to be average though, but there I, yeah. I definitely was. So, um, we talked a little bit about the Department of Justice is actually going to change the structure of possibly of of how uh, buyers actually interact in the market. What do you see happening there in terms of people actually hiring buyers agents and the sellers no longer paying the buyers commission? So I'm curious to see what the outcome of that that case will ultimately be. I mean, I think it's looking like it's leaning one way now, but uh, you never really know how it'll turn out at the end. But I, I think that um, it, it'll make it more difficult for people to buy um, because it's it's not that it's, it's not that you get a buyer's agent and that, you know, they can't negotiate or they can't find the stuff, but, but there's a lot of times where you get a, um, a situation where people want to control both sides. And if they have that ability to, to cut someone out, um, what I learned there is that there's uh, a lot of ego built into it. So people don't ever want to feel like they're losing a negotiation, even though you're, you're both working to win. Um, so I, I think that 
I think it'll make it more difficult, but I'm not sure that if it were to go that route, that it would be terribly detrimental. It would, it would really just change the structure of how things are done. Buyers don't realize now they're already paying that side. They're just paying it to the seller on the way to the, the buyer's agent. Yeah. And the, and the purchase price. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. I know some sellers though, that if they felt that the buyer side wasn't being taken care of by a buyer's agent, they wouldn't be happy with that. Like if this is the commission, I'll pay this, just go get it done and just leave me alone. Like it, it, it seems like having that buyer's agent and then being hired would entail the seller more. It may be more work on their part is the way I see it. I mean, just when I get hired a lot, it's like, Oh, is that for the buyer? Okay, great. I don't want to know anything about that. Just go make it happy. Go get the buyer, sell the house. That, that, that definitely makes sense. And I, I would agree with that. I, I also think that, um, they probably wouldn't be, even if, depending on the, the outcome of that case, I don't think sellers would be precluded or not allowed to pay that side. I think the NAR just might not be allowed to force them to pay that side. Right. Um, so I think there will be a, I think there will still be a majority of sellers that choose to do that because it, even now it's in their best interest. Um, and, you know, just because some people don't realize that something's in their best interest doesn't, doesn't make it so for, for the rest of the, you know, the, the market. Um, so I, I think there'll still be some, some, a good chunk of sellers that choose to do that. Uh, and I think that, um, there will also be some, just like there's for sale by owner, there's, you know, these, uh, you know, flat fee MLS listings. I mean, there's, there's all kind of ways to, to sell a home and, you know, different budgets or different mindsets. Um, but I, I don't think, I think this would just add one more way. And I also think that, um, I don't think it would crush the industry. I think it would take out some agents that maybe aren't quite as good as negotiating or capturing their audience or, or showing their value. But um, I, th I think it's just going to add, if, if it were to go that way, I, I think it would just add one more avenue for the people that are like, you know, in that mindset. Yeah. That's the way they want to do it. Either side, buyer or seller. Uh, when you were dealing with buyers, they were used to that. Was there anybody just really frustrated by this process of you having to find listings for them? Because I know we talked about in our first call is that we were in St. Anion in France and my sister-in-law had said, you guys should buy a place here. And I was like, great. Who's your agent? You know, I want to talk to them about the market and they can show me a few places. And she's like, I don't even know if she remembered who her agent was. And then she was like, oh, no, we just call each one of them. And they show. And I was like, oh, no, I wasn't even interested in calling an agent per the, when right. I found out if there was there was a couple houses in town that we could go look at. And I was going to have to we were going to have to call four, three or four different people. I was like, no, we'll go to the museum or something. They will go to a castle or something. I just wasn't even interested in all that work. Well, think of how many buyers do that now. I mean, think of how many agents say that they can't get a buyer to commit to them. Uh, you know, and, and you, they, you have a buyer looking for a home and, you know, any, I, I sell homes in, in Tampa as well as Jacksonville and, and, and soon to add Miami. Um, and you can imagine that there, how many people that'll call and say, I'm not going to commit to you because I'm going to go with whoever can get me the best deal or whoever has, you know, people just, if they don't understand, I, I don't know that it's really going to change that much. I mean, there's already a pool of buyers that call seven or eight or 10 or 12 real estate agents before they find someone that's the right fit. And I think that, you know, it's, I think it'll make real estate agents step up their game because if you can't show that you're adding a benefit, there's even less incentive for them to hire you. Yeah. I, I know there's a lot of um, noise I see it about uh, the, the bar and how low it is to become a real estate agent. Yeah, I, I, and I don't know. It's it's difficult to say which uh, which side of that is right, but it, the way it is, I think that uh, the top performing agents have to commit to themselves to get a certain level of education and you know create their own ability. And, you know, getting that real estate license is, I mean, that's really just step one. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's so far down the totem pole of actually what it takes to to be both a good agent and and to to represent people and to be a good negotiator and to solve the problems. And not only that, but just to know what problems to expect. Um, I mean, that's just, it's, it is a low bar to get that license, but um, I'd like to see it be something, you know, where you have to do a, maybe an internship or, 
you have to yes. work with someone for you. I would, I'd, I don't mind so much the low bar to the license. Um, I'm an entrepreneurial kind of guy. I love to see people being able to make their own way based on their own mm -hmm. efforts. I, I think that it would help um, both the buyers and sellers and basically the end customer if that person was kind of forced to have a little more training and education and mentorship, you know, along the way. Yeah, I'm not embarrassed. I was... I was an assistant, but I'm not embarrassed to say that when the, the downturn came in 2009 and 10, I was doing okay. But 2011, we were getting kind of scared. My husband's in construction and the work was slowing down. So I went and became an assistant again. And that was kind of mid career. And that was amazing. And I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to tell people like, oh, my income went down and my business went away. So I just kind of went back to school because sure. we were doing like 30 short sales a month, that just accelerates you. So even just being a little humble in this business could help you get a leg up and not try to be, you know, well, I, you know, I, I wasn't doing anything and I was just reading stuff online or, you know, it, it's just like, don't yeah. hide your head in the sand. You actually kept trying to, to try to figure this, this whole business out and kind of stay and, and in that's, the game. Exactly. And that's super Anybody, you still have to do that. There, there's right. Um, if if you're gonna do good, you, you have to. You in this business, especially, you have to stay on top of it. Um, I think one of the most cringy things I hear is when someone says, "I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for 20 years." Oh, because a lot of times there's the the mentality is still what was working 20 years ago. Um, so I would much rather have a high performing agent that's selling, you know, five, 10, 20 homes a month than someone that sells five homes a year for the last 20 years. Um, the market changes and you've got to be ready to adapt to it. And it changes so swiftly. So there's, um, I am next to Silicon Valley. So I'm kind of next to Facebook and Google and Chrome and uh, Google and Chrome, Google and all the uh, companies, the big companies. And that market changes so radically that it typically will kind of seep into our market within six months. But now it's kind of more like about four months. And I just had the opportunity to work in that area so I could kind of see, and it kind of gives you a, a different focus on what's going to come down the pike. And it was interesting because I just did another deal with an agent who works over there. And I was like, I've been working in your market. Where have you been working? Like she was just so behind the times. And it was just, I, I was like, what are you asking me for? It was just not in, so it was kind of like what you said. It was like, Oh, I, I've been doing this for a long time. And it's like, yeah, but you really have to kind of be doing it within the last year and a half ish or so because of the the change. It's the other way to get around that too. I mean, if we were even going to go down that road would just be, um, becoming a partner on a listing, like I'll, I'll sometimes, uh, bring in another agent who might have experience in that field and as bring them into co-list with me. And that way I get to learn a little bit about their style and their, their expertise. So I can still gain a little bit. And I'm going out in 18 years. I never think that I know everything. I'd still think, oh, I'd like to learn that piece of it. I have somebody who's looking into land. I don't sell very much land. So now I've got to look for an agent in my company to help me navigate through land. And I've already talked right. to somebody who said they'd help. So yeah, it, learning every day is really important. Yeah. The most successful people I know constantly learn, constantly go to seminars, have coaches that, you know, that look at a big picture across the country and 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 that's another thing that I, I think is a perspective that I've got. Um, and I don't know if it's maybe super great or, or either way, but I've worked in a lot of you know, several different markets. So I've worked in uh, Germany, uh, Tampa, just outside Northern Virginia, outside of D.C. As you know, as as my wife you know moves around or as you know, as we you know, travel with the military, um, it's it's a it's really hard to, to ramp up and, and get started building that, that base of clients. Uh, customers, but at the same time, um, I've learned to learn to study a market and find it really fast and and understand, you know, the trends. And I've you know I've I've hired coaches and I've I've learned to look at the big picture, and I think that that would benefit so many people, right? Um, because even just like you said, the the difference of being, you know, where you are compared to you know Silicon Valley, and it's just you know right there, and and how those changes come down. Well, if you're already talking to people every week that are in Silicon Valley, you're already four months ahead of the curve. Um, like when the, the market went 
as it has in the last year went you know nuts and in, in you know my area, it was already that way in Northern Virginia two years ahead of that. So I had already experienced what it's like to be in uh, competitive offer situations where you've got thirty deals or thirty offers, um, or where you you know where the list price is the starting price. You know, and uh, you know in Florida or other areas that I had been or even heard of, you know that was very unusual. But now it's normal across the country. And I think having that kind of different view, at least for me, it helped because I kind of knew not only what to expect, but how to navigate it and how to help people. So, um, you know, having that mentorship or, or experience in the recent times it helps a lot. And I think that, you know, going back to the other thing with the, uh, you know, the possible ruling on NAR and changing the way the commissions are, I think that's going to make it even more important for people to recognize that they need to, when it's come times for them to hire and it's not free until it's done, when it comes time for them to hire, that you know, it's, it's important who you hire. Even now it is, but even more so then. What's your market like right now? It's it's still pretty hot. We but we are seeing um, more listings. So as of yesterday, we had twenty seven hundred uh, mm. current active listings in our market, um, represented about a one point two months supply, which is the longest, the most it's been in about a year. So it's uh, we're seeing more, but they're they're still selling fast. Interesting. I just put a listing on last night, but it's been crickets. It's kind of scary. Um, I don't think that's it. I just think it's because it's not available to show just yet that, but, um, this week we have 200 and, oh no, we have 219 listings for our whole area. Oh, wow. And when you take that, you have to pair off all the stuff that people don't want. Then you probably get down to maybe, maybe 80, 90 listings. And how big is that area geographically? How? Oh gosh, I don't know. I think. I mean, is it twenty miles across, five miles? Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, probably from one end to the county to the other, maybe twenty five, thirty miles. Yeah, maybe. That's a, that's a good size market <laughs> uh, to have only two hundred listings. I think so. God, I could be wrong about that. I don't know, uh, but we have a lot of different areas. So we have mountains. Then we have a low-lying kind of farm area. Then we have the beach. Then we have all kind of the areas in between. And sure. So um, so when people look at that, if they go, oh, there's 200 listings, well, there's there could be a good 30 of them that they they don't they don't want that area because it's in the trees or the, yeah. another 25 are in an area that they don't want to live in. So the, the number grows really small once you start kind of ticking off some of those areas that don't work. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the, the MLS market that I said sounds like it's much larger than that. So I'm, that's, I'm looking at all of Northeast Florida, which includes, you know, four counties and uh, actually really even more than that when, when you get to the edges of the MLS reach. But but even still, uh, you know, 2,700 is a is a good size uh, increase over, I think it was 20, and now I'm, I'm guessing, but it was much less than that. That's the most it's been in a long time. Um, but it's still just, just over one month's supply. Um, so hopefully, but we're, we're seeing more turnover too. So, uh, and multiple offers. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, now it might only be four or five offers instead of, you know, 18 or 20, um, you know, that it was, but obviously interest rates have a lot to do with that. People are really rethinking stuff or pausing to decide if, you know, that's exactly what they want to do or, you know, you know, for, for whatever reason, uh, I, I think interest rates might have curbed the the number of offers. Uh, and that goes into a whole nother yeah. topic. And I, I've, I've got to touch on it. But um, I mean, I, I think that the interest rates right now are really it's just benefiting the cash buyers that have been, you know, in, in the game for so long. And now when people can't make a you know, they the interest rate goes up and their payment goes up and now their debt to income ratio changes and they can't maybe they can't afford that. It just takes them out of that pool of offers and, and it just opens it up to even more cash. So I, I definitely don't think that the, the uh, that's going to slow down sales. I just think there, there'll be less competition for, you know, that little, that reason. Yeah. I've been warning. I have a YouTube channel and I do updates and I've just been warning people that cash is going to come back. So if you're, you're an investor sitting on the sideline and you're getting a loan, you, you may not get a deal because you're still going to go up against cash because now they'll just come back. They'll, they'll get a better price and they, you know, the, the cash just comes back, especially our area. We have a lot of cash when, I mean, yeah. interest rates are so low. There was no reason to use cash, but now we're heading back into that Absolutely. territory. 
and we're seeing a lot of people from California moving you know, to this area, to Florida, uh, that I've seen you know several this year. And with real estate prices being so different, so much higher, frankly, in, in, uh, in California, when when someone sells their you know home that they've been in for 20 years, they take all that equity. You know, homes in you know Florida and Georgia and South Carolina look like they're on sale, yes. uh, even though you know even though for you know the local community it's you know it's it's still risen you know 25, 30, sometimes 40 percent or, or even more. Um, but but to someone that's coming you know and selling a 20 year owned home with loads of equity coming out of somewhere like New York or California. It, it still looks like it's on sale. So there's still an enormous amount of competition. Uh, we have a lot of people from this area move to Idaho and okay. the Idaho prices are going up. Um, they're, they're getting, they're getting up there. So they're starting to, with their demand, you know, they're going up in price. Yeah. And of course that, that gets into rent and all the other things too, which is why I, you know, I still think it's, you know, I'll, I'll say it's still a good time to buy because it's still, it's still increasing. And, and uh, there's no cap on what someone can get for, you know, there's no cap on rent increases, um, you know, especially as taxes go up to the landlords and the property owners, um, you know, that inevitably gets passed on to the, you know, the tenants. And, you know, there's the, the only way to prevent that is to own it yourself so that you can, you know, at least fix shop for your insurance and, yeah. you know, in, in states that have a homestead exemption like Florida uh, you can cap how much your tax, your property taxes can increase, and and uh, you know home ownership is still a great thing. And uh, even though, even at five and a half, sometimes six percent now, um, it's still a still a good time to buy. Yeah, um, somebody uh, I had a sign off, and the and the buyers were saying, "Well, do you you know you see it changing?" And I said, "Well, uh, not too much because if they look at rent and they look at buying and then they look at past appreciation rates." The numbers just don't work for renting because the rent That's our hot. rents are so crazy here. Yeah, and when people want to say, you know, I don't want to spend six percent interest. Well, I mean, really, if you're renting, it, it's a hundred percent interest, right? It's a hundred percent expense. Um, at least, at least when you're purchasing, there's there's some portion of it going to your principal, and that you can claim those, you know, those equity gains. So, well, the other part of it here too in Santa Cruz, renting is actually a scary prospect because at any point the seller may decide to sell just because the market's changing or the market's doing great. There's always that. And then we have um, a lot of older landlords that at some point just get out of the landlord business. Um, so th there's a lot of uncertainty with renting here. So that, that kind of fuels that purchase so they can just grab what's theirs. Um, so we connected over how HGTV is changing the way buyers buy. And you had, you had a really good take on it. I have, I'm talking to someone in a couple of weeks and we're going to talk about new construction connected with HGTV, which will be fun. Cause once I started talking to people, everybody had their own little spin on it. So, uh, tell me your thoughts about that. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I just think that it makes it look easy, um, which is, you know, that's the, the, glory of TV. Um, but I, I think those shows, you know, might put a perception in someone's mind that it's easier than it actually is. You know, you, you it's always, you're pre-approved, you look at three homes, you fall in love with one, you decide what you want to negotiate and you go home smiling. It does not work that way all the time. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I think it's TV shows like that, especially their popularity with as many people watch them. Um, I, I think it's created a, a mentality of, oh, it, it's it, that, that's how it's done. Um, but it, it's a TV show like anything else. Um, it's it's not how it's actually done. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Well, one thing they don't talk about, I noticed I've watched a few, is that like who pays for the inspections, who does the repairs? Because right now in our market currently, the seller does all the disclosures, all the reports, and any repairs that they're going to do and then just tells the buyer they have to be completely as is. Absolutely. And how is that in your market? What's that like? Uh, very much the same. Okay. Uh, so, and it's going to depend on the price point and you know, obviously each deal is different, right? But, but the majority of the time the sellers are, are if they're going to do something, I had one actually just closed today um, that the deal was where there was a, a, irrigation well and the irrigation well during the inspection was found 
that it had some problems and the you know the buyer was in love with the yard and wanted the irrigation so the seller said well, you know we'll we'll do a five hundred dollar credit but that's the first credit I've seen in a while um and you know that was a you know for that and then sometimes HOA do do I actually have another one closing today that ended up with a thirty five hundred dollar credit for some HOA violations now they wouldn't fix they wouldn't fix the HOA violations so the, the buyer still had to take assume those violations but the seller did you know credit it so that it wouldn't you know delay or cause things to fall apart through title. Um, Things you don't see on TV. Right. Yeah. Oh yes, for sure. Because, you know, some HOAs can, can have a lien. So it's really, if there is an HOA violation, there's, you're assuming a lot of risk. If you take that lien or take that, the ability for the HOA to put a lien on when it was the previous owner's problem. So if, if you're ever buying a, you know, for anybody, paying attention if you need to buy a uh you know if you need to buy a home that has an hoa lien you got to make sure you get that done quick and within the because otherwise it'll be your lien uh, you know right away uh we have to we have to provide clear title so all liens have to be cleared so if you're a seller here you'd have to fix it It, it, right here it's that way too if it's a lien if it's just a violation and the hoa hasn't sent actually created the lien so that there's a known violation but not yet a lien then you have that that window from the violation, you know, now somebody else purchases it. And if you don't get it fixed, it can become a lien later on. So that that's and the lenders are okay with that. Yeah. Wow. I have not seen that yet. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So repairs, um, maybe the whole um, I know buyers seem to get tired of all the paperwork required by the lender. Um, and then all the disclosures, I don't know how many disclosures we have, but I mean, my latest disclosure pack was 458 pages. Oh my gosh. That's, yeah. I, I've not seen one quite that big. I'd say maybe I'll forward it you know, to you. Under, <laughs> under, maybe under 200 pages. Um, but yeah, another thing in, in underwriting, especially if it's a, if it's a finance deal that you're definitely not going to see on TV is the, the details that the underwriters need you know, all hours of the day and night, you got underwriters asking for, for something. And then you provide a new bank statement and then you, you know, received a, uh, you know, sold a car or something or, or whatever. And then there's a, 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 what they consider a large payment. And then you got to disclose what that payment's for and then track it. Um, so there's, and that can be painful. I actually just went through that recently myself. Um, there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of details that go into that and it, it can really be frustrating. But, you know, that's just part of the part of the process. Just as a side note, I've been telling everybody I did get a home equity line of credit uh, because I own a laundromat and I need to buy some equipment. Okay. So I drew some money out of my house and I had a buyer call me and say, OK, well, you know, the crash is coming because everybody's taking money out of their home. And I was like, do you know how hard that is? I do. I just did six weeks of just. Yeah. It's, I mean, I couldn't believe the stuff that they asked for. And then they would tell me, no, we want the, it to say this when I filled out a form. And then they come back and say, no, we want it to say this, which was what I already had said. I mean, the, the jostling be, because of how how they don't want to take on any risk. They're just so risk averse. It's, it's so much harder. And that's just not that transparent at all. People don't realize how difficult it really is. It's not that easy. Yeah, exactly. They're they're going to make, especially after you know the two thousand eight mm-hmm. you know disaster, uh, the lenders now are going to make very sure that they've got the the best chance of getting their their money back, and that means you know for that second loan or you know whatever you're going to take out, they're going to make sure that your home has enough equity that if you default on it, and they you know they foreclose on the home, there's still enough equity built in, or that you've got a very solid track record of paying and, and earning. Um, you know, and, you know, being self-employed or an entrepreneur, it's it's even harder uh, right. because there's there's even another line to that. So, um, you know, having a, having a steady job with the W two makes it, you know, for for these purposes, it makes it easy, but it's still very difficult um, yeah. to to get through that underwriting process. And when you when you're watching on TV, you just you know you show up and you have some coffee and you pick out a house and you <laughs> go on about your day. And I wish it was that easy. <laughs> yeah, I did a video that said uh, Zillow is not Amazon. Because right. I felt like some people just felt like they could just, you know, because they call me and they just like, give me a list, like they're ordering a hamburger, you know, it's like, 
It doesn't work like that. You have to look at the location and, and look at the house and the neighborhood and, and how you're going to commute to it. Cause we have, we have crazy traffic times that make it very hard to get around our area. And I mean, there's just so much to look at. It's just like it's three bedrooms, two baths. That's like the least of your worries. Exactly. Uh, and then you got the commute, like you said, um, do you get, do you have a lot of people in your area that might buy sight unseen if they're moving from out of the area? They don't buy sight unseen. Typically what we do, um, I've done a few is we do FaceTime and do video tours. We've had some people do that moving. Um, I had one gal, she's actually, they're going back to Japan, but they bought a house here and she came and saw it and decided that it may not work for her family and then went back to Japan. And then I ended up um, writing an offer on it and doing a tour of it. And then we did the home inspection that way. And then I had a gal from Chicago buy a place for her son to go to UCSC, our local university. And um, that was all online. Yeah. And I think maybe working with military, uh, you know, as they're coming from overseas or another area. And I know that I've personally bought four homes uh, without ever stepping foot in them through um, through either, like you said, a, a Facebook video or having maybe a friend go look. Uh, the first time I had a friend go look, um, and now you know now we've moved to just uh, now it's all just video walk through. Yeah. Um, and then I you know I'll say hey all right let's just go stand in the yard and I want you to be very quiet for about fifteen seconds. I just want to hear what the neighborhood's like through your microphone. Um, you know, things like that. So, uh, that's, that can be a challenge. And I, I, that's definitely, that, that's definitely, even I, you know, we, uh, we buy a home in a new city and even though I, I I'm obviously a real estate agent and, and know the market and know how to do that, I still get a, a good buyer's agent. Um, and I, I don't ask them to share their commission. I get a good buyer's agent and, uh, have, have them, you know, walk through, have them, you know, do all the things. Cause if I can't be there, I want someone that really is motivated to, work, help, help me. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask them to do all the things I would expect, you know, myself to do. So I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's a benefit to it. So I, I, you know, we, we just recently, when we bought the home that I'm, I'm in right now, uh, we were coming out of uh, DC, Northern Virginia area. And, uh, you know, I bought it that way. Um, and I think that, I don't know, maybe there should be a TV show about all the people that do that, because I think that's a lot more challenging than, yeah, just showing up and you know picking something out. Yeah, there wouldn't be much. There wouldn't be. It wouldn't be hard to produce. Could, I'll be online. <laughs> right. Sorry, the video is already there. Exactly. Uh, how many houses? Wait. How many houses have you bought, and how often? Uh, roughly every two to three years. Uh, so since twenty uh, twenty twelve, we've been. Yeah, I'm gonna stick out my fingers and count here. <laughs> um, we've had one, two, three. Seven. Wow. And seven. So you win some, you lose some. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say that for sure. Um, but you know, it, it, it we don't always, you know, even uh, you know, even taking pride and you know being you know great at offering and you know you don't always get the the first the first one you go for. Um, we we just bought one. Um, actually, our our next we're moving to, from Jacksonville to Miami, and we just closed on it this morning. I signed the papers this morning. Oh my gosh. Um, and I've still not stepped foot in it. Um, but the, you know, as, as we went there, um, you know, we, we wanted to see it and we wanted to go, I, you know, we, we bought that, but we, we knew that it was going to be the right commute. It was the right size home. It was, you know, all the things. So, you know, once we eliminated all of that, it was kind of like, okay, what's left. And then, you know, that's how we pick, uh, you know, we picked that. Um, but yeah, so this, this is our, this will be our fifth home that we've bought or is our fifth home that we've actually bought without going inside of it first. Wow. One of them I went in, but my wife didn't go in. So I, I think that counts at least for her. Um, yeah, I'm, one's closing right now. The title company's calling me right now. Hopefully that means they've closed it. Um, right. what was I going to ask? So when I meant win some, lose some, I meant when you sell. No, never lost. Good. Good, good, good. No, I, 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 I broke even on one and by broke even, I made $1,000 of one home that was, and I sold it in 2009. Oh, so, wow. you know, you, you know, 
Um, you made a thousand I, more I, than a lot of people. <laughs> ex- exactly. But I've, I've never lost money on, on buying a home in a new area. Um, you know, you buy the right neighborhood, you buy the right school district, you buy the right, you know, type of home. Um, I like to buy one that may not be the absolute tip top in the, in the neighborhood, you know, that needs some work. Um, not a, not a ton of work, but needs some stuff. And then, so, you know, if you get that, you know, at the, at the bottom of what the, you know, price per square foot for the neighborhood is, and you put in the work, you're not going to lose at least so far. Um, so uh, so, so, no guarantees, (laughs) your experience may differ. Well, I know, I I know that people try to, I mean, you're actually in it and working it and really said, but you know, I have people who try to game the market and I've had some people win and then the next one they lose and, or they lose and the next one they win. Like not every single one, you know, because it just depends yeah, on maybe. what their situation is when they have to sell. Yeah. One, one we were in for only 13 months and we ended up renting it for two years and then we sold it. Um, and that was, you know, so even though we had only lived there a, a brief time, it was just, we expected to be there longer and work. Um, but even that one we've made, actually, I think that was the one we made the most on. Um, it just because of the, you know, the market. Wow. Well, well, I really appreciate you uh, making time for me today and uh, letting us know. I know that I'll probably uh, tout you in the show notes of being um, a, an agent for the military because I haven't had anybody on yet who who serves the military. So oh, that's, that. that's kind of nice. And um, imparting your wisdom of where we might go, where buyers have to go find their own agent and then pay them, which is just a sobering thought. Yeah. And, you know, and I, it's just, it's a perspective. I mean, people mm-hmm. already do that for just about what other job do you get? You, right. Do you get to hire someone, work with them for a month and then decide you're not going to pay them? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just I ghost them and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, it's the realtor lady, Michelle Replogle. Is there a subject you would like me to explore in real estate or maybe about Santa Cruz? Feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. Or if you'd like me to help you buy or sell real estate, that's also something that I do. You can contact me on Instagram, live the Santa Cruz life, or on my website, michellesellsforyou.com. That's with one L. My Facebook page, live the Santa Cruz life as well. Or check out my YouTube channel, Live the Santa Cruz Life with Michelle Replogle, and my email, michelle at michellesellsforyou.com. I would love to hear from you.